It's Thursday, February 10th, and time for your Barbados Today morning news update. A horror and a nightmare. That's how the Leeward Islands Airline Pilots Association is describing the experience of former Liat workers seeking outstanding severance pay owed to them since they were sent home two years ago. And the association's chairman, Patterson Thompson, says the issue still has not been adequately addressed by any of the shareholder governments. In fact, Thompson is accusing the Barbados government of failing to act early to settle the issue of severance pay for employees. He's adamant that when the decision was made to shut down the airline based in Antigua, it was the Barbados government's responsibility as majority shareholder to have a plan in place for the workers. Tourism and healthcare officials are being chided for what has been described as inefficient protocols at the Grantley Adams International Airport that are causing major headaches for visitors to the island. This as chairman of the Barbados Hotel and Tourism Association, Rene Coppin, warned that industry players are at their wit's end over lack of transparency and clarity regarding the systems that have been governing the entry of airline passengers over the last two years. We have used COVID as a scapegoat for what is fundamentally lack of proper systems and processes in the management of things on this island. And we continue to have, as if we are in Groundhog Day, it's become a running joke for us in our board meetings, that we continue to have the same set of complaints regarding the ease of entry into the island, the treatment to the testing protocols, the, the transparency of the protocols, and the way that people are entering through the and, and even the unionization of the Safe app, we, we continue to have issues with all of these things and they're not being addressed consistently. And these are things that we've asked as an association to have addressed over the last two years. And we continue in 2022 to have some of the same problems that we had in 2020 when we started this pandemic. And we are at the point where we feel that this is no longer something we can continue to be silent about. Current protocols require vaccinated travelers to present a negative PCR test taken within a 72-hour period prior to travel or a rapid PCR test to avoid quarantine. The BHTA is calling for rapid antigen COVID-19 tests to be accepted for entry as an alternative to the PCR test. We are asking that we can have the entry protocols clarified we're asking that we can have the entry protocols, if possible, reflect the reality as it stands in most of our source markets and based on where things are right now internationally with COVID. We're asking that we can have our, our BIMSAFE app functional so that it can be used effectively so we can reduce the bottlenecks at the airport. We're asking that the entire process at the airport can be streamlined and made simpler and easier. And these things will make all of us safer. The reality is that Omicron is a slightly different variant than Delta, and I'm not going to pretend that I'm a scientist and try to speak to scientific terms, but in terms of transmissibility and in terms of when it shows up, we are, we are told that the window is a lot shorter with Omicron than it has been with previous variants, and therefore the testing has to vary or change a little bit. And we're seeing within our competitive set, certainly that they have changed their testing requirements to make them more responsive to the, the current variant that is dominant across the world. As I said, I'm not trying to pretend to be an expert in health. What I'm saying is that certainly we want to ensure that our protocols are both keeping Barbadians safe, our visitors safe, but also reflecting the realities of the virus as it emerges. And we have requested, therefore, that we look at expanding our testing regimen to include the rapid antigen taken within a shorter time frame before travel, we are doing that as a measure that we're seeing that has proven very effective in other markets, certainly in the Caribbean and elsewhere. Countries are being urged to learn from the lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic so far as clinics and hospitals once again become full. It's coming from a director of the Pan-American Health Organization, Dr. Carissia Etienne, who disclosed that the Americas remain in the grip of the latest COVID-19 wave as infections reached 4.8 million this week with 33,000 new deaths. She said while COVID-19 cases fell by a third in the region, including the Caribbean, healthcare workers continue to face challenging conditions due to systems that are unprepared to support them. When cases surge exponentially, as they have in the past few weeks, the burden falls mostly on the people that power our health systems. For them, there is nothing mild about the Omicron wave. 
Even before the pandemic, the health workforce in the Americas faced serious disadvantages that were only exacerbated by COVID. Years of underinvestment in our health services, aging information systems, and poor labor conditions made our health workers' job even more challenging. The pandemic revealed a deficit in the availability of health workers, on even distribution of health workers across our countries, and inadequate training. Many health workers were at risk of burnout. There's regional and international news after this short break. Hi, I am Onika. I am a mother, I'm a daughter, and I'm a wine educator. When vaccines first came on the scene last year, I was really apprehensive about getting vaccinated. I was worried about taking a drug that I felt was experimental. So at first, I really wasn't about it. I decided to get vaccinated. I had to acknowledge the fact that I am asthmatic and my son is also asthmatic. I have a career in wine. We depend on our senses and I decided that I did not want to risk it for being afraid of taking a vaccine. Coronavirus has affected everyone around the globe. And keeping this in mind, make sure that your decision is not a selfish one and that you're thinking of the benefits of the whole. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. The news from the region, St. Lucia's Prime Minister Philip J. Pierre has tested a positive for COVID-19. More from HDS News Force. Confirmation comes from Press Secretary Mondi Lewis in a statement issued Wednesday afternoon. The government leader received the diagnosis following a routine test in keeping with the health and safety protocol regime. The Prime Minister is self-isolating but will continue to run the affairs of state. As part of the protocols established by the Office of the Prime Minister, Honorable Philip J. Pierre underwent a routine PCR test. On Tuesday, February 8, 2022, Honorable Pierre received a positive PCR test result. As per public health protocols, he is presently isolated and will continue working from home. According to the press secretary, Pierre, who is fully vaccinated and boosted, appears to be asymptomatic. The Prime Minister is doing well and exhibits no symptoms at this time. Prime Minister Pierre's full recovery is anticipated within the next few days. And finally, Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Adaman Gabriesus, says the biggest barrier faced in ending the COVID-19 pandemic as a global health emergency is ensuring all persons in every country have access to tests, vaccines, and treatment. Depending on where you live, it might feel like the COVID-19 pandemic is almost over, or it might feel like it is at its worst. But wherever you live, COVID isn't finished with us. There is no, no borders. And as we all know from Omicron, any feeling of safety can change in a moment. We know this virus will continue to evolve. But we are not defenseless. We have the tools to prevent this disease, to test for it, and to treat it. Where people have access to those tools, this virus can be brought under control. Where they don't, this virus continues to spread, to evolve, and to kill. The biggest barrier we face to ending the pandemics as a global health emergency is ensuring all people in every country have access to those tools. The WHO Director General was speaking at Wednesday's launch of the ACT Accelerator, which he said is vital. As outlined in the financing framework we're launching today, the ACT Accelerator requires 23 billion U.S. dollars to save lives, address the threat of Omicron, and prevent even more dangerous variants emerging. That includes an urgent financing gap of 16 billion U.S. dollars for the ACT Accelerator itself, 
with the remaining 6.5 billion US dollars to be self-financed by middle-income countries supported by multilateral development banks. We call on all higher income countries to play their part in fully funding the ACT Accelerator and ending the pandemic as a global health emergency. That's news. But for the very latest, visit us at www.barbidestoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.